when chess players debate who the greatest chess player in history is, three names come up far more than any other. Bobby Fischer, Garry Kasparov, and Magnus Carlsen. This game is a vote for the great Garry Kasparov. This game was played when he was only 14 years of age. It's a training game, but it is against a grand master, Elmer Magaramov. And this game is an astonishing piece of work involving a double sacrifice. You absolutely cannot miss this amazing game. It's also very instructive. So let's begin. Magaramov had white. Kasparov had black. Let us jump right in. Knight f3 was played. Knight f6, d4, e6, c4, d5. And Kasparov plays the orthodox. Queen's Gambit declined as black. He was not yet playing the Grunfeld or King's Indian, which he became famous for. A knight to c3, bishop e7, bishop g5. So far, standard stuff, but soon enough, Gary Kasparov is going to spice things up in this game with aggressive and innovative play. Castling kingside, e3, allowing the bishop at f1 to comfortably develop at d3. h6 played by Kasparov. White can take on f6 here to try to speed up development, uh, but uh, Grandmaster Magaramov decided to keep his bishop and not give up the bishop pair just yet. He has more space, keep pieces on the board. Now, one of the problems black has in the queen's gambit declined is this bishop at c8, because the pawn at e6 blocks it, and it doesn't have a lot of mobility. So Gary Kasparov plays b6. This is a standard idea, trying to activate the bishop on b7, and maybe later if dc4, it can open up and play on the long light square diagonal. Now, cd5 is common, so that if the bishop lands on b7, it'll be blocked by a pawn. Bishop d3, but here queen to b3 was played. Not the most common move. Basically, white is putting as much pressure on d5 as possible. The knight, the queen, and the pawn at c4 all pressurize the c4 pawn. Bishop to b7, continuing with the plan, and we can see that Kasparov is only one move away from completing the development of all of his minor pieces, so development was primary in his approach. And here white plays bishop takes knight, even after rejecting that move earlier. Basically, the knight is a defender of the d5 square, so he's removing one of the defenders of that square. Bishop takes f6, cd5, ed5. Now the pawn on d5 is fixed, and black does not want to have to play c7, c6. That's an awkward move, blocking in the bishop at b7, weakening his structure. Uh, so he comes up with a very interesting approach here. After rook to d1, placing this rook opposite the queen so that if the position opens up, White will have pressure against that queen. Kasparov plays the move c5. Now, at first, this looks like a blunder, because if white takes on c5, which is what he did in the game, and black responds bc5, well, queen takes b7. The bishop is hanging. He would lose the piece and the game right then and there. But here, Kasparov had created a novelty. This is at 14 years of age. Knight to d7, a short-term pawn sacrifice that allows his pieces to become feverishly active. It's really astonishing how active his pieces become in this game. Uh, if cb6, this actually is not that good for white, because then knight to c5 hits the queen, queen c2, knight to e6, and black is continuing the plan that we have in the game where he advances and open ups, op opens up lines. Pawn takes a7, being greedy, then d4, ed4, rook to e8, placing the rook opposite the king, and after bishop e2, knight to f4 hitting the bishop with the rook and the knight, and also threatening the g2 pawn. After castling, queen to c8, who would create a pin on the c3 knight. The knight couldn't move because the queen is at c2. Uh, after rook to d2 to keep things defended, then knight g2, a knight sacrifice, king g2. This is a sample line. Queen to g4 check, king h1, and then boom, rook takes bishop, knight takes, bishop takes f3, mate. So white already has to be extremely careful in this position. Knight takes d5 uh, is okay, but after knight c5 hitting the queen, knight f6, queen f6, queen c3 to offer the trade of queens, then queen g2, pressuring g2, pressure down the long diagonal, and black has very nice activity in exchange for a pawn. So Magaramov instead plays the move c6, trying to avoid all of those complications. It would be a blunder, actually, for Kasparov to play knight to c5 here, even though he's attacking the queen, because... Uh, the best approach for white would be to ignore that threat. Just go ahead and take the bishop with the pawn after knight takes queen. Take the rook with the pawn, promote to a queen, which would have to be taken. Then pawn takes knight. And white actually has two minor pieces and a rook for a queen, which is a pretty sizable 
uh, material advantage. So instead, Kasparov simply takes the pawn at c6. Now here, knight takes d5 is probably white's best, just going ahead and grabbing that pawn. Uh, but instead, he plays knight to d4. He blockades the passed pawn. Seems like a reasonable idea, while also gaining a tempo against the bishop at c6. And here Kasparov makes a very interesting move. Bishop takes knight. Now, normally, you don't want to give up the bishop pair like that, but he has a very interesting idea in mind. If white retakes with the pawn, then queen to g5, hitting this g2 pawn, making it hard for the bishop at f1 to develop, and threatening rook f to e8 check. And black has a very nice attacking position here. So he takes with the rook. But now we see the real brilliance behind Kasparov's uh, knight to d7 move. He plays knight to c5, hitting the queen. When the queen moves, now knight to e6 hits the rook. Now, when we talk about the principles of the isolated queen's pawn, the first thing the side with the isolated queen's pawn wants to do, if they can, is advance the pawn. You want to move it and liquidate it. He hits the rook first, and when the rook moves, boom, d4. Sac In this case, it's a sacrifice of the pawn. But look what happens when he... White takes it. By the way, knight to e2, try and take advantage of that of the pin on that file is the best, but quickly, white, black would still have a nice position. Pawn takes, but look at this. The bishop at c6 has a nice diagonal aiming right at g2. The rook at f8 is about to go to e8 to, to threaten the king at e1. For the exchange of a pawn, black has a, a very nice position. Now, rook e to e8 is played, threatening a discovery from the knight at e6. And here, black plays f3. Now, if he plays bishop e2, trying to block that check, then bishop takes g2, rook g1, knight f4, and white is in huge trouble with all kinds of attacks on his king, which is stuck in the center. The light squares are a mess. He would be lost. The idea behind f3, of course, he wants to blunt the bishop at c6, reduce its uh, effectiveness along the diagonal, and then hide his king away at f2. And if he's allowed to do that, this might be a way to survive the position. But here Kasparov plays his second sacrifice, a bolt from the blue. Bishop takes f3, two exclamation points. If the queen captures the bishop, then knight to g5, a discovered check from the rook, and the knight attacks the queen, and he loses his queen. Um, so he takes with the pawn instead, so he doesn't lose his queen. Uh, but here, there's only one move that wins for black. If he plays the move knight to f4 check, then after rook to e2, white can sort of get away. After queen to h4, king d2, and white is starting to survive the position a little bit. But queen to h4 check, that is the powerful move, and it's forcing. If he plays king to e2, then Kasparov would play knight to f4, double check, and mate. White is checkmated here. He can't go to d3 because of the knight. The queen controls this diagonal, the rook. There's just nothing he can do. And he can't interpose because the knight is also delivering checks. That would be mate, which means that rook to f2 is forced. So now he's starting to get pinned. And Kasparov builds on those pins. First, knight takes d4, discovered check from the rook at e8. Now bishop to e2. So now we have two pins. A pin on the bishop and a pin on the rook at f2. Knight to f3 check takes advantage of both of those pins. Either the bishop or the rook can take the king. The king can't go to d2, so the next move is forced. King to f1. Queen to h3 check. The king can't go to g1 or e1 because of the knight. Next move is forced. Rook to g2. Now knight to g4 piles up on the rook at g2. Rook hg1. And what is the main principle of attacking chess? Invite everyone to the party. Kasparov has one piece that isn't really doing much right now. That's the rook at a8. So he gets that actively involved. The rook goes to d8, attacking the queen, gaining a tempo. Um, queen to a4 is what modern computers say is the best chance for white, although black is clearly better. But after knight takes rook, rook takes g2, queen to e3 is a very powerful idea. Uh, the threat, of course, is rook to d4, rook f4, and white's king is still in a lot of trouble. But Magaramov instead played queen to e1, which makes sense. He wants to keep the queen cozied up to the king for defensive purposes. But now Kasparov, Kasparov unleashes another brilliant shot. Rook to d3. 
threatening to come into f3, taking advantage of the pin on the bishop at e2 against the queen. Uh, in fact, it even takes uh, the computer on my laptop a little time to find this move, and eventually it does acknowledge that it's the best move. Um, if bishop takes d3, then just rook e1 check. If the king takes, you can just take the rook, and the bishop at d3 is hanging. It's, that's, uh, that obviously does not work. So instead, queen to f2 was played by Magaramov, but now rook d... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I was one move ahead there. Knight to f3. Again, this knight really can't be taken because of bishop f3, rook f3, and it pins the queen to the king. And he's attacking the rook at g1, so that rook moves to h1. But what else can he do? He's completely pinned down by all of Kasparov's pieces. Now rook d to e3, and this is just a beautiful arrangement of pieces from black. Rook h to g1. He's really, all he can do is just move the rook back and forth at this point. Now, here Kasparov makes one of his uh, famous moves, the, the kind of move he made all the time. He just plays the move king to h8. Kasparov, before he would unleash the final coup de grace on his opponent, would often move his king just one square to safety, just to make sure there were no problems, and then continue with the final sacrifice. Um, in this game, computers show us that rook takes knight would actually work immediately. After bc3, knight h2 check, the king would have to move as the rook is pinned, but then queen c3 check, and quickly the king gets exposed and uh, is going to be destroyed. This, this is mate, by the way, because the knight controls the f1 square. Uh, but king to h8 was played, now rook h1, just going back and forth, really kind of a zugzwang position. He only has one move he can make. Then b5. And in this position, Magaramov resigned because there's nothing he can do to stop the incoming b4. He can't move his own b-pawn because the knight on c3 would hang. Maybe he played something like a3, then a5 would come in, and b4 eventually. And when the knight goes, the entire position collapses, the bishop is undefended, and the game would be over. A masterpiece. Astonishing from a 14-year-old. It is no surprise that this player became world champion for 15 years. I hope you enjoyed the game. See you again soon at Chess Talk. Goodbye.